Oh no! What? I have to fill out the FAFSA for me to go to college. You mean this form? No. That form! Hi, I'm Rebecca M. Carroll, founding member of The Coaching Educator. And I'm Corey Johnson with Corey J. Speaker. For you to learn more steps on how to fill out the FAFSA and get financial aid, continue watching. Hello everybody and here we are looking at the 2019-20 FAFSA Gov. This is the preview presentation. It, this is going to be awesome because this is what you are actually going to see. And as a school counselor, I have filled out, helped parents fill out at least 2,000 of these. So I'm pretty excited because this year it's actually on a phone app. So what you'll be seeing, you'll be seeing me go over the pages, but each page will show you what it looks like on a computer, and the next page will be what it looks like from your cell phone. So whichever one is most convenient for you. So we'll just be going through this. Now, this is the first thing that comes up. You'll be looking at the overview and this presentation. It's going to include screenshots of the application and the correction process to provide you a distinction between the user's experience. I actually like this. It helps you to understand. Please feel free to push forward on sections that you need to know or look at if you already have your FAFSA ID and things like that. But here we go. For 2019-2020 version of the FAFSA, what you need to be looking at is it's going to be opening up October 1st. I always recommend that you wait a week because there are so many people in there. And contrary to popular belief or the myth is out there that if you don't fill it out immediately, the money runs out. Um, really, all colleges have a priority deadline. It's really important for you to just know what that priority deadline is and, and meet that deadline. And you do not have to worry. You can use the web demonstration site preview um, beginning September 30th, um, which will your own, but this is one that is provided for school counselors. As you know, I'm a school counselor. I just do it independently. So here we go. You log into the FAFSA. Here you go. This is what you are looking at, and it will say start here. You're going to start as a new student if you have never, ever filled out the FAFSA. And as I am discussing this, when I say you, I'm talking about this is the student who's heading off to college. Please keep in mind, my strongest recommendation is that parents and students should be filling this out together. There are questions that parents are the only ones that know. There are questions that need to be answered specifically by the parent. And unless your child is unusually developed in the uh, accounting arena, most students cannot answer the questions thoroughly. This causes a ton of problems. It causes you to be audited as far as the school is concerned. And it becomes a nightmare. So do it right. Parents should be filling this out. Best case scenario, students and parents are together, but if not, don't worry about it. So when you begin, it will give you three, you know, some different opportunities to be able to learn. At any point when you see a question mark, if you click on it and open it up, it'll explain it in more detail. And they actually do a really nice job. So all through this form, there'll be question marks, with every single question, if you do not understand how to answer it, please feel free to open it up. You can do a pre-early aid estimator if you want. Um, it's, it's You might want to do that. We actually have an amazing one attached to our website, thecoachingeducator.com. And you'll see a pig. And if you go in there it, and fill it out, it'll give you a fabulous report. These are extremely helpful for accountants. They're helpful for financial advisors if you're working with them. And it's helpful for the parent to really see and the student to see, OK, I really want to go to this school, but I still have 32000 left after I've been given a student loan after I've been given my grid scholarship. So we talk about a lot of scholarship information on our uh, web on our YouTube channel. Please 
like and share. And if you have a question, if you make a comment, we'll answer it as quickly as possible. You can always sign up for a free consultation as well. So let's begin. So here you have, the, this is just showing you what you're going to be seeing. Here is what it looks like on the phone app. And in some ways, I think because we're so used to doing everything on the phone, it's actually laid out a little easier. So this is the same information, but this is how it comes across on the phone. So you're going to log in. You are logging in as the student. They will ask you, you can also log in as a parent or a preparer. And um, when I work with parents, whether it's online or if they're in my office, we're always sitting side by side. Here's what it looks like to log in for your app. Now, in the beginning, if you have never created an FSA ID, it's probably very important for you to start there. And as you see, there is a link that says create one. Now, before you begin, if you want a super, for, a super helpful sheet, we actually in our downloads, so the coachingeducator.com forward slash free downloads is our TCE FAFSA data sheet. And this is really important for you because this you can print out, you can keep track of your logins, your passwords, your verified email, and what is called a save key. So let's move forward. You're going to be going to a place that where you create your FSA ID, which is your login, your signature. It's just an electronic signature that belongs to you. And I will do another series on that. So that will help you to understand the process for that. So one parent has to have one of these to sign off and the student. Even though you'll be filling out information for either both parents or if you're from a single parent family and you don't have any visitations or you don't see your other parent, you only have to fill out for one parent. If your parents are married, if either of your parents are, have been divorced and are now remarried, you will be filling out the FAFSA with the spouse of the parent that you're giving that information for. So if you live with your mom or you see your mom the most and she's remarried, you will be putting for parent number one, your mother, and the parent number two will be your step parent. Even if your, your father is alive, you're seeing him, and you have a relationship. So let's assume that you've filled out your electronic signature and you're ready to roll. You're filling this out as if you're the student. You begin with your name, your social security, and this is where you have to fill this in. So for many applications for admissions, I always encourage kids, until you're going to that college, you don't need to give your social security number. But for this particular form, they match you to your signature, so you actually need to do this. Note that when you're filling this form out, you really need to look at how they want you to lay out the information. So if you look at the birth date, you're going to be giving two digits. So, you know, 10 for your, if you're born in October, it would be 10. If you're born in January, 01. So then you do your date with two digits as well. And then you do four digits for your year. You accept, you're basically saying that you understand what this is, that they are not, you know, this is their disclaimer and you move forward. Here you're going to start your 2019-2020 FAFSA, and that is over to the left. And you will click on that button, and here's what it looks like on your phone. Then they ask you for a save key. The save key is used for when you go in and make any corrections between if you add more colleges, if you remove colleges, if you um, have moved and you need to change any data before you get to school, you can go in and change your FAFSA. It's important for you to save your save key. One of the things that I encourage, I encourage families to just use the same save key. It'll be that much easier. So now it will go into an explanation on everything that the FAFSA is about, how to sign it, the documents you need. So if you're unclear about the documents, which ones you need, I, you're going to need your tax forms at a minimum. 
for so for this year they're looking for 2017 you're going to actually need to have your w-2 as well many accountants for whatever reason do not provide a w-2 with your tax return and i'm not sure why you really need to ask that they do because there will be questions that are asked, and you'll see when we come up, that you really need that information. So if nothing less, expand your document section so you understand what you need to use to fill this out. And here's what it looks like on your phone. So dependent student with parental data. Basically that means you're under 23, you're not married, whether you're living with your parents or not, you are considered a dependent. They are looking at your information two years back, so it's important for you to fill this out appropriately. And whether you feel independent or not, there are only certain situations that are allowed to be considered independent. So you start by filling out everything that they're asking you for. Please make sure that you put the correct birth date and that you put the correct social security number. Don't guess. Here you are on your phone. Next, you'll be asked for your address. It's not your future address. It's actually you want to put your parents' address. Even if every year you're going to be filling this form out, it's important for you to understand that even if you have a different address, utilize the your parents' address at this point going off freshman year. You will be letting them know where you've lived. So if you have lived someplace at least five years, there, then nothing else will come up. If you've only lived one year, they'll start asking you another row of questions will come up that will say, okay, how long did you live in this particular state? And then what's this previous state? And that's just for uh, colleges just need to make sure that they're providing in-state status if you actually are considered in-state. They're going to ask you to identify your birth gender, whether you're male or female. So whatever you are on your birth gender, that's what you would be putting down. You're going to be doing utilizing your telephone number, your driver's license. If you, you don't actually have to put your driver's license in. It will let you move forward without it. But if you're going to be focusing on trying to get in-state, there are some colleges by your second or third year they will allow you to be considered in-state. Very few of them, but there are some out there. Then you can, um, it would be really important the next year that you fill it out that you make sure that you get a driver's license within that state that you're trying to gain um, in-state status for education. You need to put your marital status. Now, keep in mind, you're a student, so please remember that. And if you're a parent filling this out, don't fill it out as you. You're filling it out as your student. Most students are single. The next we come up to selective service. This is at the age of 18 in the United States. You need to fill out, if you are a male, fill out the form that lets them, gives them your name and social security number, and it basically, you are signing up for a potential draft. Um, girls do not need to do this. If you are not 18, you're going to put the answer as no, you are not registered because you cannot register as a 17-year-old, but the day you turn 18, you can, so don't worry about it. When, if you put no, if you check no, Another question will come up, which basically is, would you like to register now? Just click no, because you can't register until you're 18. They ask you about what will, ha it, when, what will your high school completion status be when you begin college in 2019-20. So, so basically, you'll be getting a high school diploma. You want to go off to college as a freshman, even if you've earned dual enrollment, even if the college that you will be heading to considers you a second year sophomore because of all the dual enrollment or AP classes or college credit that you have earned. It does not matter. You need to be reflecting that you are a freshman going off. So you're going to be, what will your college grade level be? You're going to say first year freshman. 
you're working on your first bachelor's degree. This is your four-year degree. It is You will be either working on a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor's of Science. And then they ask you if this is your first one because the Pell Grant and other grants that are available through filling out this form at the college level, they only provide Pell and grants and things like that for your first bachelor's degree. That doesn't mean that you're precluded from scholarships, but it does mean that for this for the purpose of the Pell, you will not receive Pell money for your second bachelor's degree. That's always a little bit of a bummer for some students. Then we end up, here's your phone, same thing, going over the same questions. So student information, are you considering work study? So if you're going to a very a high-end school, an Ivy League, if you're going to a school that you actually, for a state school, would not be considered financially needy, but for the purposes of an Ivy League, you would be. You'd be considered more financially needy. You want to check yes. But if you're going to your state college and you do not end up being considered, according to the federal government, as being financially needy, then you end up having, uh, you, you should probably check no, because you won't qualify for, wit, for work study opportunities. But that doesn't mean that you can't get a job. You can get a job, and I encourage kids to have at least 10 to 15 hours while they're going to college. It's nice to have some change to do stuff with. Were you ever in the foster care system, even if you spent one week, it would be very important to check that. There are many, many opportunities and grants and scholarships that are provided for students who have experienced the foster care system. And so colleges recognize that it's that, that much harder to get to college, and so they're very generous. So it's important if you have experienced it, please put it in. They want to know about your high school completion for your parent number one and your parent number two. If your parents are married, they're your birth parents, your biological parents, the easiest way to keep track of this is always put, look at their income tax form. I, util, I usually use the first parent that's listed as parent number one, the second parent listed as parent number two. And it's just an easier way to be that much more organized. If you are not aware of your biological parents' completion of schools, then for whatever reason, you do not have to put it in. When you drop down that menu, there is a one that just, I don't have this information, and you can utilize that. The other thing is, is if you are um, with, if you are working, if you have a parent that, um, you know, you're adopted or you have, um, you're living with people who are absolutely considered um, your adopted parents or you were adopted at an older age, those actually are the parents that you would be filling the information out. If you aren't, if you have guardians, then you actually still, whatever information you have about your biological parents, you put it in for that. This is just data they're collecting on, are you the first person to go off to school for your particular family? So here they ask you if you have ever received federal student aid, and most freshmen have not. So you can pretty much say no. If you are a sophomore, of course you have already. And if you filled out the FAFSA, some kids um, didn't know how important it was and they didn't receive any aid. So now we're on the eligibility worksheet. They're asking you if you have ever been convicted of, uh, for the possession or sale of illegal drugs while receiving your federal student aid. And so if you have, you do need to. And that's a conviction. That's not if you've been charged. So if you have, if you were just charged then you still can say no. It's important, um, take this question seriously. If you have been convicted, many colleges work with the student. They usually make you go through a process, whether it's meeting with different people to make sure uh, that they're, you're, you're creating a situation where you're correcting your action. Um, but if it says yes, 
then you usually start working with the specific college if you have to say yes. Basically, as a freshman, you'll be saying no. So based on your answers, if the answers are no and no or yes and no, then um, you're going to be eligible for financial aid. And this is just what it looks like on your phone. So now we get to the student information. They're asking you what high school you've been through. And just keep in mind that there are high schools with your same named high school across the United States. So I have seen where people have put the wrong high school in, the wrong location. And so therefore they were considered out of state even though they were in state and that was a little bit of a nightmare to correct. So please make sure you're clicking on the accurate location and name of your high school. You put it in, you put the city, state, and you move forward. Now you are adding your colleges. This tool allows you to add 10 colleges. Many students, especially if you're, you know, uh, have some really positive opportunities and you're at the top of your class, many times more colleges will send you applications and they'll give you an opportunity to apply for free. There is a, a somewhat of a horrible thing going on where too many kids are applying to 40 plus schools and that is just not in your best interest. It is really, really smart to align yourself and to really get a great college list by doing a lot of your research. That's one of the things that we do at The Coaching Educator, and there'll be another video up on how to really identify your best college match. And that's what you want to do. You want to apply to six to eight, maximum maybe 12 to 14. But right now we're talking about the FAFSA. They let you do 10. So what happens is you put your first 10 in and your student or you as the student will be receiving eventually emails from each college that says, we have processed your FAFSA. As soon as you get that email verification, then or in the letter, there are a few colleges that still send a hard letter in the mail. So that means that you can go back in, you can pull that school out of your FAFSA, and you can actually provide another name of a college. So that is how you create a situation where you can put more than 10. And um, But again, I encourage you, if you do your due diligence and, you know, apply to the schools that you're better matched for, which takes time and research to pull those lists together, that's the most important thing you can do. So next, here is what it looks like on your app, your phone app. Now we're going to, we've got our list of schools. You have your 10 schools or six schools that you've put in. And it's going to ask you... Um, It'll list it like this. You check it, you add, and you can add the button, add more schools, add more schools until you get all the schools in. The next thing you're going to see is they're going to ask you for your housing plans. It's important, just put that you're going to be going, that you're going to be living on campus unless you have an absolute apartment that's already set and you know that for a fact if it's your vision to eventually get off campus in an apartment, that's fine. But for now, just put that you are going to be living on campus. They really need to know the numbers. Next, we are going to your marital status. So they're asking you if you were born before January 1st, and that usually fills in within the, it'll already be marked no. And then, but they ask you if you're married as of today, as of the day you're filling out. So if you have an engagement coming up and you're getting married in three months, you might want to wait <laughs> until you're married before you fill this form out because you, as soon as you're married, you will be considered independent. So it's important for you. If you're not married, you check yes. They're also going to ask you if this is your not only your first bachelor's degree, but they're asking you if you're working on a master's or a doctorate, which you are not. Most people aren't. It's a very unusual situation if you are without your bachelor's completed. So that answer will be no. And here's what it looks like on your phone. Same thing. Next, do you have or will you have children who will receive more than half of their support from you between July 1st and June 30th? 
So what basically they're asking, do you have a child on the way? And if you do, whether you're male or female, it's important to check yes. And that will help um, with your financial aid. At most colleges, they want to see that you have the opportunity to go to school. And um, so it's important for you. If it's no, you put no. If it's yes, yes. Then they ask you if you have dependents at this point. So do you have any younger children that are already born? And you, the answer is yes or no. And here it looks on your phone. So then we're going to go through the military. Are you in the armed forces? So ROTC does not qualify for this. So you might be signing up for ROTC. That generally happens just before you get onto your college campus. But what they're asking is, are you in the military? Are you active duty? Um, you know, They ask you if you're at any time, um, were you again, they're asking you, were you in foster care or a ward of the court? Um, they also ask you if you're an emancipated minor, which generally speaking happens well before you're 18. You have to, to be emancipated. And I have had over the course of my 20 plus years, people ask me, well, should we just emancipate? This is a very big court proceeding. You have to prove you have no relationship with your parents. You literally have to have no relationship. And I have had to help students who actually are in that situation, and it's it's not pleasant, um, and it's not to be used for the purpose of gaining better financial aid. So for the most part, if you are not emancipated already, then you there's no opportunity for you to be emancipated, and that's not a good strategy. So does anybody um, have legal guardianship of you? So this is, there are several students that I've worked with who um, live with their parent, their grandparents who happen to be their guardians. They're not adopted by their grandparents, but their grandparents are guardians or an aunt or an uncle. And that's where you would check that box. If none of these apply, you check none of the above. And that is your view on the phone app. Then they ask you if you are homeless or have been at risk of being homeless. And so they, if you check yes, there will be further questions that verify whether or not you were homeless. Next, they're asking you if you will provide your parents information. And basically, their expectation is that you do. So if you said, well, I'm not able to, that doesn't work because then it stops, um, they, if they don't consider you to be independent based on their questions, you cannot move forward unless you say, yes, I will provide the information. If you only live with one parent and you have no idea where the other parent is, you do not have to worry. You're basically, you can fill this form out with just one parent's information. If you truly don't know the information or where the other parent is, you might vaguely know, don't worry about having to track them down and get information. If you do not have a relationship at all with your one of your parents, this form can be filled out with only using one parent's information. Okay, so now we are looking at parents' marital status. So here we're looking at if your parents are married, great, that's the easiest. If they're not, um, and you're only filling out for one parent, keep in mind, you have to know when the divorce was. So if you say they're not married or they're single or they're divorced, which when you drop down the menu, it'll give you these options, then their expectation is that you either provide the month and year of the marriage or the month and year of the divorce. And so that's important. If your parents have never been married, there's an option for that as well. And here's the phone app. Next, parent social security number. It is super important that you get this right. So if you are filling out parent number one, so we're working on the parent's information, you're going to do parent number one. You put all their information in. You need to know their birth year. So I have a lot of students who know their parents' month and the day, and they don't know the year. So if you have your parents' tax forms in front of you, they're actually, that will be provided there, as well as their social security number. So next, 
you will be looking at the parent email address. So make sure you're using the email address that your parents want you to use. I know some parents have work emails and their preference is you use their personal email. Then they ask if your parents have lived in the state that you have identified as your state for the last five years. And again, if, if it's lower than five years, they're going to ask you a series of other questions. Basically, where were you before and when did you move? Next, you're going to be looking at your household size. So this is a worksheet. So the grade area that you're seeing, that is a worksheet that you're filling in numbers. You're just answering it. And then the bottom, but just below where it says your mother's other children, that actually will be the number um, that will come up just for your mom, your parents, your what, whomever's in the household, they will fill in the number as you're filling in the grade in area. So that will help you. The other thing is they ask you how many, how many people are in college. So it's important for you to know that e even if your parents are in college, they're not interested in that. They only want to know who is in college that is a student under who's not a parent. So you're filling in that. So you might have a couple siblings that are still in college, or you might have younger siblings and you're the only one. So you'll fill out, you always include you in that number. Next, here is, so they're going to ask you how your parents file your ta their tax returns. So they have moved the taxes that they're looking at two years previous. So the two years previous, this 2017 for this year, and if next year you can watch this video again, just know that we're looking at 2018 taxes. So you're going to put already completed. If you have your parents' tax forms in front of you, then you know they're already completed. There are situations where parents' taxes, for whatever reason, are not completed. Don't worry about it. You mark it. And then it is important that you utilize an accountant to give you some numbers. So accountants can pretty much estimate your or uh, there are several people who do their own taxes, even if they are in business for themselves. But basically, if you cannot provide an already completed tax form, then what they're going to request is that you estimate, and there'll be a lot of questions and estimations that you'll have to do. On your parents' tax form, it will say what they are, what they are filing as. There are several options. Most parents will file married filed joint return, but there are still some who don't. And it might be married filing separately. It is very important for you to look at what it says on that form and you fill it out accordingly. Did your parents file in Puerto Rico or a foreign tax or have a foreign tax return? You'll say no if it applies to no. Yes, obviously, if they have. And then they have a link to the IRS. So you press that button. Here's you're looking at your app. Same information we just went over. So here they're asking you, they've brought you to this form, the next page. You're identifying parent number one or parent number two. And if you've used our form that you can find on the coachingeducator.com forward slash free downloads, you will see that it has the information for parent, your parent who's going to be signing off. So parent number one, we're just going to assume you're going to use parent number one, which you don't have to, but you have to match it up with that web, with, with their social security number. So there'll be a social security user ID. So you'll be doing your user ID from your FSA ID. You'll be, or you can use your verified email. So I'm going to pause right now about the verified email. So both of you, the student has their own signature, their electronic signature, and the parents have their electronic signature. When you're going through the process of actually applying for that, at some point they ask you, do you want to have your email verified or do you want to skip for now? Please take the time to verify it. Take the time to verify your phone number as well. So when you're filling it out for your student, 
Make sure your student's available at least by phone or text so that when the verifying code comes through, you're filling out the information for the email, they send a code to the student's email. The student can forward it to you. You can plug in the verified code, and then you do the same process for your phone. It's super important to not skip that. It holds up this application if you do. So do your due diligence, get your FSA IDs verified. So now they're asking for the parent's verified email or their user ID and their password, which will help you get into the IRS portal. So now they're saying you're proceeding. You're proceeding to the IRS. You're leaving the FAFSA. You're going to say, okay, you get that. They're going to let you know that it's now a U.S. government system, and it's important that you're using it properly. So next, here's where you're going after your tax returns to be loaded in. Many people, they fill in their information, and it won't go through. It says there's an error. You need to look at your tax form. However, your accountant or you, if you're doing your own taxes, filled it out. If they have caps to everything, if they wrote street completely out or if they shortened it and used an abbreviation, you need to have it exactly how it looks and the exact address. So one of the dilemmas is if you've moved and But two years ago, in 2017, your address was a different address for your whole household. You have to put that old address or it will not go through. So it's important for you to do that. So you fill it out exactly how they ask you to, and that should help it go through. Next... We are going, it will say, okay, this is the information you're asking for. You check the box. So basically you want to transfer your tax information into this FAFSA. So you check the box to the left and then the, the over to the right, transfer now will light up. I believe it's a blue color. You, it'll light up. You can click on it. And then pause, just pause, because it's going to be wheeling and looking like something's happening. Don't touch your keyboard. Wait for it to download. As soon as it downloads, you'll see this page. It will basically say, okay, it's transferred. And so it's important that you wait for this page. Don't touch it. Now, this is where that recommendation of having your W-2 so many parents I work with do a lot of consulting. So they may have a W-2 for their regular job, but then they have their consulting 1099. So you, you need all these pieces of information, and you'll be filling out parents each parent's income based on the full tax income that's recorded on your tax return. Having that W-2 makes it very easy to split it up. It's very hard to find the difference between, okay, what did my dad make versus my mom? What did my mom make versus my stepdad? It's important for you to actually have that information. So now you have your parent information has been entered. This is on your phone. And here we go. Now, based on your W-2, if you look at a W-2, you will see many boxes. It will say box number one, two, three, all the way up to 15. So they're asking you for the information that is in box 12. So it is so much easier if you have that W-2 in front of you and you fill in exactly what it says. If it says zero, put a zero. If it says 12.02, you want to just fill in 12. As you can see, they want you to just put in the beginning before the decimal. So that's important for you to know. Don't try to fill in the whole information and don't worry about the sense. So then they're asking you if there's been any grants or college or AmeriCorps benefits or things like that, and you need to fill that out accurately. Um, and then you move forward. So now they're asking you if your parents received child support. Many parents have court-ordered child support agreements. 
Many parents do not receive the amount that was court ordered. So what you need to do is only fill in for that particular year what was received. If you did not receive the amount that you were that is court ordered, do not worry about it. Put the exact amount. They're not going to penalize you at all. Whether you and they're not going to consider it information; they're just gathering data. They also want to know if you're in the military, if you had housing, or if you had benefits, or things like that. So some some people in different careers, many pastors or ministers, they receive a house. So they want to uh, they want to know whether or not and how much that was worth. The next thing is, and this is the easiest way to find it on your W-2, they're going to ask you to look at boxes 12A through 12D. When these boxes, you add them all up and you put those numbers in. If there's nothing in the boxes, don't worry about it. You put a zero. So again, you're going through and other untaxed information. So here's where those question marks, especially in this section, are very helpful. If you're unclear what's your untaxed income that you didn't report, or if you're, you get disability benefits, open up that question mark. They really do a nice job listing exactly what they're looking for. So that's important for you to do. And then you, you are looking at um, either a death pension or a dependency compensation or things like that or anything from the VA, work study allowance. So that's where you're really needing to gather a lot of this information. And I, I, I challenge the idea that most kids do not have the answers for these. That's why it's so important to be doing this together. Here's what it looks like on the phone. Next, we go into, they're asking what is in your parents' cash, savings, and checking account. They're asking you to add it up. They want to know what that is. Then, this is a huge error I see a lot. You do not have to include your primary residence. When they're asking you your net worth, they expect that you have a primary residence. So if you only have one home, you are not including your worth, your net worth. You're not including that home. So it's important, and I see that error constantly. You're frustrated. The form is long. You get to this page, and people are, are adding up their net worth, including their primary residence. So then they're asking you if you have a business, if you have under 100 people, you don't have to worry about this question. If you have over 100 people, you do need to calculate your network. So here you go into the, this is the app. So if you're on your phone, that's what it looks like. So now they've moved away from the parents. They're going to the student. So they're asking the students now to do the same thing. You're going to fill out whether or not you filed taxes in your sophomore year of high school. and Or if you're maybe two years out of high school, you're filling this out, you're still considered a dependent, they're looking for you to, they're, what they're looking for is two years back. So they're asking you if you filed taxes. If you did, great. You say yes, you go to the retrieval tool, just like your parents did. Even if you filed your taxes and you only earned 4000 that year, it will load down in. But many students, they don't file taxes because they don't make enough. It's not required, so they choose to not. So if you don't, then you want to check the, no, I did not file tax. That drop-down menu, you'll say, no, I did not file taxes. And so the portal won't even be available for you. They'll still ask you if you're single, um, if you were to apply, would you qualify for this? You know, an easy, so an easy tax form. There's several questions you'll answer if the answer was no. So this is what it looks like on your phone. So basically you don't have to worry about the retrieval process if you didn't. If you did file though, you're going to be doing the exact same thing. So you want to look at your tax form. You're going to link to the IRS. You're going to proceed. You're going to agree that you understand you're leaving the FAFSA. You're going to understand that and say, okay, you're in a government system, and then you're going to fill out the information exactly 
how it looks on your tax form. Fill in your address, and then it's asking you if you want to transfer your tax information. So you check the box to the left that you do want it to happen, and then you transfer now. It will let you know whether or not it transferred. If it didn't transfer, go back, check, look to see if you filled out exactly how it was filled out, and then go from there. If for some reason you've tried everything and it still will not go through, then you will be required to manually fill in your tax, the, the tax information. And it basically will be saying, okay, on line 37, what is your adjusted gross income? So you're going to find the line that they're looking for. And if you still are confused, you open up those question marks and it will really identify which line you're on, what information they need. It takes, it's a lot longer to fill it out manually, but if for whatever reason, I've had friends who had uh, an identity theft situation, so you won't be able to link and download it. So you, you have to go through the process of manually filling it out. And the thing I recommend is that you're in a quiet space, you're really focused, and to, if two of you are doing it together, it's very helpful. So now you're going to, if you're self-employed, they're asking if you're self-employed. That's that K-1 form. You answer yes or no. And then you move on to, do you, they're asking you the same thing. Do you have combat pay? You need to look at your W-2. Do you have taxable or adjusted gross income because of it? You need to... Um, ask if you need to answer if you've used AmeriCorps dollars because that's considered uh, you're getting paid. So any question they're asking, you need to fill out accurately. They're asking you if you have, um, a, you know, untaxed, if you have any untaxed portions that um, rolled over for an investment or if you started a retirement. And there are kids who have, so it's important if you do have an investment or if your grandparents started something for you or your parents, whatever is in your name, you need to answer this stuff. So then they're asking you if you have any untaxed portions of pensions, which is like a retirement. And if you don't, you answer no. If you do, you say yes, and then it will give you a box and it will put it in. So now we get to child support. If you have had a child and you're still quite young and you're paying child support, you have to record um, if you've received child support or if you've paid child support. So that's important for you to look at that. Um, you know, they do understand it makes it more challenging to pay for college, whether you're receiving child support or you have paid child support. So you want to look at the questions very clearly and answer them appropriately. So next, you're going to go into the taxable earnings from need-based employment programs, such as your federal work-study. So if you received work-study, and this is your second time filling out this form, you're going into your sophomore year, that's where you're going to end up plugging in how much you made. And you basically get a W-2 from the college. If you're in work study, they've calculated your money. There is something called a 1099 that you uh, also will be good information from the college if you've received scholarships. And that's kind of, those are the numbers that you'll be filling in. Child support received. So here's your child support received. So within this form, they're asking you what you paid out and if you've received any. If, you, if the answer is no to either of them, it is zero. You place a zero in there. And again, they're asking you, do you have a housing allowance? Do you, did you get many students who go on a mission or who have um, the AmeriCorps situation? They oftentimes get a, a stipend and they're getting housing. So whatever it is, that you've received, it's important for you to go on um, to put it down. And then they go into your, um, have you received anything paid on your behalf? And this is where you have to get strategic. And so sometimes it's not in your best interest to get a check paid to from your grandparents to you to go to school. Sometimes it's 
in your best interest to wait and take out a student loan and have your grandparents pay you, pay, help you pay off your student loan as a way to help you with college. There are all kinds of strategies that we go over, and I would encourage you to make an appointment, do a free consultation before you fill out this form so we can really assist you in understanding your best strategies for receiving financial aid. Next, tax-deferred retirement. Many students do not have this. It's not a problem, so you'll be putting zero. But it's good for you to look at your W-2 and see what's on there. It's really good to look in those boxes and to understand how important that is. And please, if you can't find your W-2, which happens a lot, kids don't realize how important it is, you can actually go back to the company. So if you worked at a food service industry, Taco Bell or, or you know, McDonald's, they actually have a, a, an email or a number to call, let them know when you worked, where you worked, the location, and then ask them to email you an, uh, an electronic copy of your W-2. And it's very doable. And it's important for you to track that down and then save it for your records. So next, they're looking for veterinary, yeah, I'm sorry, veterinary, sorry, veterans, non-education <laughs> benefits. If you've received so many times, uh, a lot of my students have had dads and moms who have um, been deployed, who uh, serve our country, and they are on disability or they have had, uh, or they have been killed in the line of service. And so it's important um, for you to fill in this information accurately and also know that there are several grants and scholarships and I would really encourage you to look for that and um, so that you can help yourself because they always recognize, colleges do recognize that it makes it more challenging if you only have one parent or if you've lost a parent, especially one who has served our country. So here is the same app on your phone, same questions. So then they go into your student savings and checking and cash. So you add all those numbers up, you put it in. Generally speaking, unless you own a home, your net worth is going to be zero. And this is the only time you wanna be a zero. This is a great time to be a zero in here. And then they ask about a business. So again, if you might have a small business, you might have a lawn mowing business, which is great and really smart. However, um, if you have under 100 employees, don't worry about it. So next, we're going to look at, they'll let you know that you have successfully saved your whole application. And then they, want, they ask you if you're a preparer. And so obviously you're not, you're the student. So the only people that are pretty much preparers are if you're giving it to your financial advisor and they're filling it out and they have a preparer pin or uh, there are many people who have their accountant fill it out. Um, I personally, when I, with our services, we are side by side helping parents fill it out, helping students fill out this form, but we do not fill this form out. We are not preparers. So, and many school counselors are not. And um because I'm an independent student counselor, I'm able to uh, provide this service, which has been a huge benefit. This is, this is a very, very, as you saw when I threw out how long this form is, it's a big form. And there are lots of errors that you can make that will hold up your financial aid or impact your financial aid. And we don't want that to happen. So the next phase is you're going through question by question, just making sure that you did it properly. Many people will print out this form and stick it in their, in their um, file where their taxes are so you can grab it the following year. So we, you just look through it. Here's your student eligibility, your school information. It's all kinds of everything you've filled out. You want to make sure to do a really good, slow look and make sure everything that you filled in is correct. You are not a preparer, so you can skip to the next phase. And here's what it looks like on your phone again. So then it comes to the signing. So because you're a student and you're in this portal already, you click on provide a signature and you're logged in as yourself and you're logged in as um, it already has your password in there. So it pretty much gives you 
I agree to this, and then it signs. Next, it's going to ask you to provide, as you can see, a parent signature. So you're going to see here's where you agree. Hit next, and it goes right through. You click the sign this FAFSA. Next, it goes to the parents. So here we are. They're going to ask you, is it parent number one that you want to have sign, or is it parent number two? So you select the parent. And again, you can put both parents' information in there if both your parents are married and within your household, but only one has to sign. So you select the one, you make sure it's their birth date, you make sure it's the last four digits of their social security, you have your parents sign, and then they agree, they hit next. Now they have to put their verified email or their login to their FSA ID, and then their password. They submit, they sign. Both green checks demonstrate that both of you have officially signed off, and you submit your FAFSA. And that's what it looks like. You will get a congratulations page, so you will absolutely know. They also send an email to you, so it'll be sitting in your email. Congratulations, you have completed this. Now you're going to get a page that actually tells you what the college, what the federal government says that you can afford. Now, mind you, most parents are shocked at this number. Generally, it's just, and then you times it by four. So that is why it's so important that you graduate, your student graduates in four years, because you do not want to spend any more money than you have to. It's already expensive. So here you can expand the estimated family contribution. If it says, like this in front of you is demonstrating, you don't you don't have to pay anything. You will receive a Pell Grant then. You most likely will, will receive a full Pell Grant, which goes up to about approximately 6,500. But you need to be careful because that Pell Grant is only going to be 5,500, 6,500. And that doesn't mean that you can afford the rest of your college. So you really want to be matched to the college that's gonna give you the most, the most merit, grants, scholarships. You want to really have a, a tremendous match to the colleges that are going to really recognize you and want you. So that's all the stuff that we work on is that getting that list. That list is so key. But what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to expand this. You're going to want to print it out. Now, you will receive a copy of this in your email. But it's really important because your many scholarships, and my hope is that after you fill this form out, you're going to get on to applications and scholarships, and we help with that. You can book a free consultation at thecoachingeducator.com forward slash book, and we can actually guide you and let you know what you can do and where you need to be looking. So next, again, here's what it looks like on your phone. There you go. So here's an example they're showing, if you look way over to the right, on the phone it's saying, okay, this particular person that filled this out is will owe 10637 That's what they're saying. They're coming up with this number based on their calculations. So that's what they're saying you would be paying each year. So it's important then to find the college that, will, that won't be much more than that. Okay, now we're going to, as you can see, it says independent student. It's a very different form if you're an independent student, and we are going to have a separate presentation on that. So if you're an adult student or if you're a student who has lost both parents or you are emancipated or you're young and you're married you're, or you're older and you're going back to school, this next presentation is going to be for you. So thank you very much. If you liked the presentation, if it was helpful, please make a comment, please share, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we will see you. Thank you so much.